Well, as we start our lectures on tornadoes, I wanted to show you this beautiful EF4 ranked tornado from April 9th, 2015 in Rochelle, Illinois. That's in Northern Illinois. This is a massive wedge tornado. And what we have to be learning about first before we ever get into the dynamics of a storm system like this, we have to understand safety. So let's go there first. One thing I want you to remember, your number one goal is to be in a safe and sturdy shelter. Two, get as far away from windows as possible, which means get to an interior room of a house or a building. Do not stand next to windows. If you have the option to getting below ground, like in a crawl space or in a basement, get there. Get as fast as you can down there and stay down there till the whole thing is over. Basements, it's very rare that you ever hear of a death or an injury in a basement. In crawl spaces, well, you have the subfloor above you, which is protecting you from the debris, and they're also very safe. Now, if you don't have either of those two things, like for example, I used to have a house that was on a slab. What we used to do is we would go to an interior room and we only had one interior room in our first house, my wife and I, and it was a closet. And I told my wife, if I'm not there, what I want you to do is if the tornado sirens go off, go to that interior room, just like this, get in the closet with all of the coats and honestly, hug them, hold on to them, wrap them around you. You see, your goal in protecting yourself from tornadoes is avoiding the debris. It's the stuff thrown by the tornado. Do not go to an upper level. I think that's obvious. Into your room or a basement. Please remember that. Now, if you don't have an interior room, in fact, I had an apartment once that didn't have an interior room, we had a rule, and that was get into the bathtub. In fact, um, one of the things I've told my wife is if she can't get quickly enough into the an interior room or into our crawl space or into our new home, which has a basement, that when my daughter was younger, I said, go grab her crib mattress, jump in the bathtub with our daughter, and put the crib mattress on top of you. Now remember, all of this is being done only if the tornado's right there bearing down on you. Don't do these things, you know, don't go get in the bathtub with a mattress on top of you if you hear thunder, okay? This is if there's a tornado warning for your location and the sirens are going off and you're trying to be safe. So please don't overreact, but be safe. Now to show you this, here's some pictures I've collected over the years. In each one of these pictures, you're gonna notice something. The top uh, floors of these structures has been destroyed. The exterior windows are shattered and destroyed. The exterior walls are destroyed. But the interiors of each of these buildings have been preserved. But I want to make one point. I put this picture in here on purpose, the one on the bottom left. That is the front door to the uh, main school in Greensburg, Kansas, a particular city we're going to talk about a few times in, this, in these tornado lectures. That tornado was so powerful it didn't matter what part of the school you were in. The whole thing was leveled and destroyed. Some tornadoes, it just doesn't matter. If you're not below ground, your chances of survival are very slim. We're going to talk about that. But just to show you some more pictures I've collected, look at this. Looking down from above on, on these two images, the ones that are in the upper right and lower left, we can see that while the second stories were torn off of each, there were interior rooms, like this closet here and like this interior bathroom that were safe. The walls still stood. But you'll clearly, you can see in this image here that the top level was ripped apart. But an interior room on the first floor would have kept you safe. And this picture floated around a lot of the last few years, showing how this tornado even ripped off the subfloor and destroyed this basement, killing people. But I want to let you know something. This particular house was already condemned. It was already falling apart. So this was not a structure that was already well, well built and sound. So keep that in mind. Now, one other thing I want to talk about is what to do if you are on a road. Now, we covered this already with our tornado myth or fact, but let's just come back to this again. When I was a little boy, it was simple. If you saw a tornado coming toward you and you couldn't, you know, and it was bearing down on you, get out of the car, lie in a ditch. Do not do this. Modern cars are designed to protect their occupants. Stay in the car. If you can, drive away. If I was this person, this tornado was coming toward me, I would just basically do a U-turn and just drive as fast as I can in the other direction. That's because the fastest tornadoes we've ever observed are between 60 and 75 miles an hour. Most of them move around 20 to 40 miles an hour, which means you can get away, with, uh, away from them on open roads. Do not, do not hide under bridges. Do not hide under bridges. When the air goes funneling underneath the bridge, its force has been faster. We've often found people that have been killed under bridges because of the focused winds, or they have been thrown out. They've been sucked out because of the fast, the way the winds have to go quickly. Uh, those fast winds have to go quickly underneath the bridge. Do not hide. What should you do? 
tighten your seatbelt. If you can't drive away, tighten your seatbelt, pull off the side of the road and wait. Modern cars are designed to protect you. They have, uh, you know, basically crumple zones where they're designed to lengthen the, the collision time. So if they roll over, it's designed to protect you. The glass shatters into little tiny bits, not big shards that'll cut you. They have airbags and seat belts. Cars are designed to protect their occupants and they're heavy. It'd be much easier for the tornado to suck you out of the ditch if you're lying in it than to pick up your car and throw it. Now, one last thing to make a comment about here. What if you're looking at a tornado just like this one and you are not in a car and there is no nearby shelter? You're just out, I don't know, maybe in the middle of a field. What do you do? Well, if that tornado is coming toward you and you are right here, okay, I'm gonna draw you, and it's coming toward you and there's no road, you know, so you're just out in the field, run at 90 degree angles to it. Either direction. Don't run toward it. Don't run away. Run at 90 degree angles to it. Get away from this thing. All right. That's some safety about being in homes, being in cars, or being out in an open field. A lot different from what I was taught when I was a kid. Lying in a ditch is not the way to go. Okay, let's talk about what a tornado is. It's a rapidly rotating column of air that's attached to the thunderstorm and in contact with the ground. If it's not in contact with the ground, we call it a funnel cloud. And funnel clouds don't do damage like tornadoes do. So it is redundant to say, look, tornado on the ground, because by definition, a tornado is in contact with the ground. Now, what's more important is the breakdown I've given you here in this table. I'm not going to yet use the Fujita scale or the enhanced Fujita scale. I'm just going to rank tornadoes based on some kind of criteria here, weak, strong, and violent. Now, here's what I want you to remember about this, okay? When you look at this table, look at these two categories here, percentage of deaths and number and percent of tornadoes. 85%, 85%, the vast majority of tornadoes are weak, producing wind speeds less than 120 miles an hour. And of those 85%, they are only responsible for 5% of all fatalities. That means most tornadoes are weak and will not kill you. But when you come up to the strong and into the violent categories here, well, let's look at violent. Only 2% of all tornadoes reach violent status, wind speeds over 200 miles an hour. Yet those 2% of tornadoes are responsible for 70% of all fatalities. When you combine the violent and strong categories, 95% of all tornado deaths come from just 15% of all tornadoes. Very, very important statistic. So the odds over your lifetime of you seeing a weak tornado, very high. I hope you never encounter a strong or violent one. Now, something else I want to point out, which we're going to talk about in our next lecture on tornadoes, is what you see over here in the width category. Do you see how I say weak tornadoes are quite small, maybe only 100 feet wide, but strong ones could be a quarter mile wide and even the violent ones over a mile wide. Now, this is interesting because when things rotate, the tighter the rotation, the faster the wind speed. So the smaller the radius, the faster it should go. That's from the conservation of angular momentum. Yet for some reason, the more bigger tornadoes get, the more powerful and faster they spin. We're going to talk about that. There's a very interesting thing that happens to these big, violent, wide, wedge-like tornadoes. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. All right, some average tornado statistics. Average size, well, they can range from 150 feet wide, and even smaller than that, all the way up to well over a mile. Uh, typical, average, 100 yards wide. It's about the width of, uh, length of a football field. How much time do they spend on the ground? Well, we've looked at this. Turns out that on average, they're on the ground for about 10 minutes, and they have a track length of around four miles. Okay, what's the average wind speed? About 110 miles an hour for the United States. That would give it an EF scale, that's an enhanced Vegeta scale ranking between an EF0 and an EF1. In what direction do they move? Well, most of them move the direction that the supercell moves, which is from the southwest to the northeast, somewhere around 30 miles an hour. That would be average. Now, what's the average warning time in the United States? Well, from some current research, over the last 30 years, it's around 13 minutes. So when the sirens go off, the average time between when the sirens go off and when the tornado hits a particular location, 13 minutes. But our recent outbreaks, over the last five to eight years, we have lengthened that uh, time to around 30 minutes. And there's a lot of very important research going into understanding what longer warning times do. Now, listen to this, okay? Some research showed that if you increase the warning time beyond about 30 minutes, people make bad decisions. They now begin to get comfortable knowing that they've got time between when the warning happens and when the tornado actually gets there. 
And we surveyed Americans and discovered they'll fill that time by running errands, taking care of things, trying to get something done. When in reality, we want the warning to be immediate and for people to take action immediately. So our most current research is really not focused too much on increasing warning times, but understanding the dynamics of storms so we can better model them and better forecast them actually days in advance rather than just hours to let people know about the severe weather threat. But when it comes to warnings, the longer the warning time, that's not necessarily a better thing. And how does a tornado kill you? It kills you with debris. Debris, it's the stuff the tornado throws. It throws cars, it throws parts of houses, it can throw, well, pretty much anything. So that's why you want to put as many walls between you and the tornado as possible. That's why you want to stay in your car. The car's a protective shell. Even if the car gets thrown, you have a better chance of surviving being thrown in a car than being thrown by the tornado outside of a car. Okay? Keep all of that in mind. All right, let's get into some statistics about tornadoes and a little bit of history. Here's a fun question. Which state was the deadliest tornado in U.S. history? Within which state? Texas, California, Oklahoma, New York, or Illinois? Got an idea? Well, it turns out it's my home state, Illinois. Back in 1925, March 18th, a tornado, which is right now the longest observed tornado track in history, went through southern Missouri, southern Illinois, into southern Indiana. It's called the Tri-State Tornado. It killed 700 people, making it the deadliest, the deadliest tornado in U.S. history at 700. Look at this school building here in Murfreesboro, Illinois. The top level removed. You know, brick walls, brick walls, cinder block walls destroyed. That's what powerful tornadoes can do. So Illinois has played host to the most deadly tornado in U.S. history. And this is one of my favorite pictures. Look at this. This is a one by six shoved through a two by four. Incredible to see that, right? A one by six. No, that's a two by six. That's a one by six shoved through a two by six. That is what the powerful winds of a tornado can do. Impressive to see that. Again, we didn't have the National Weather Service back in 1925, but they would have issued a severe thunderstorm watch and a tornado watch box just like this because all the ingredients came together there. And as you just saw, well, we had the damage and destruction to these buildings and the tri-state tornado, the longest lived tornado in U.S. history. Okay, when it comes to looking at tornado fatality statistics from 1940 to 2017, we can see some interesting things here, all right? Do you see how before about 1975, which is a line right here, okay, we had a lot of big events, like the April 3rd and 4th, 1974 super outbreak. We had uh, these outbreaks in the 60s, this huge outbreak in the early 50s, killing several hundred people. But after 1975 moving forward, we only had one big event, the April 27th, 28th, 2011 outbreak, which killed more than about 100 people. Uh, and I want to tell you something. The reason why that we have such fewer, such fewer deadly outbreaks is not because there's fewer tornadoes. No, 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 no. The reason is because of satellite technology. The reason is because of Doppler radar technology. The reason is because of weather modeling. In the 1970s, we saw a rapid increase of all of those. And as a consequence, we're able to better warn people. Still, here are the statistics. Uh, the 30-year average is 69 deaths per year. The 10-year average, though, is 101 deaths per year. And that's because of the bias we have from the 2011 super outbreak. Since 1940, when you add up all of these numbers here, 7,600 fatalities in the United States. Now, I realize this is nowhere close to the number of fatalities that we get from things like cancer or, or upper you know, respiratory issues or, or, or things like heart disease and stuff like this. But this really just shows you how much deaths have changed since technology has been able to basically help us better warn people in the event of storms. In my opinion, this number should be even smaller than this. We should be able to better warn people than we can do right now, and people should be listening to those warnings better. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Now, in terms of weather fatalities, I'm showing you two graphs. The graph on the left is from 2011. 553 deaths from tornadoes. It dwarfs everything else. And that's why this graph looks kind of funny. 
But when we look over here from the weather fatalities from 2017, let's just kind of look at each one of the uh, uh, graphs here. We have the 30-year average in yellow, in blue the 10-year average, and in red 2017's numbers. Now what I want you to see is, over the last 30 years, heat is the number one killer, followed by flooding. But when we're talking about over the last decade, because of this one event right here, tornadoes are the deadliest form of weather in the United States. Now, when you think about over the last 30 years, it ranks third. But over the last 10, because of that one big event, April 27th and 20th, 2011, it ranks number one. Keep that in mind. Now, 2011 not only had nasty, nasty storms that went through the southeast, but also had this historic storm that went through Joplin, Missouri. Right now, this ranks as the seventh deadliest on the all-time record in the United States at 162 fatalities. And this was a tragic, tragic day. Now, at the University of Illinois, there's a class that you can take called ATMOS, that's ATMS 324, led by Professor Jeff Frame. And he takes students storm chasing every summer to learn about storm dynamics. They chased this storm, and it was a very sobering day for our students because the image you've been looking at here, this is a before image in Joplin, Missouri, taken from Google Earth. After the EF5 tornado went through, it did that. And it doesn't matter. If you're not below ground, surviving this is nearly impossible. And this tragic day had 162 fatalities. Well, we just hope that days like this don't ever, ever happen again. Incredible to see that. Well, where are people when they're killed by tornadoes? Let's keep going with the statistics. Please remember this number. 43.94. Nearly 44% of all people that are killed by tornadoes are in mobile homes. Now, let's just stop and talk about this. If you live in a mobile home, or at some point in your life live in a mobile home, or know somebody that lives in a mobile home, tell them to abandon it if a tornado is coming. Get out and run away. I'd rather have you running at right angles from a tornado that's approaching a mobile home than to stay in it. If you have a car, get in your car and drive away. Do not stay in the mobile home. It only takes about a 70 mile an hour wind to roll a mobile home. And when it rolls, well, basically people die in mobile homes by being bludgeoned to death. That's the stuff in the mobile home rolling over and killing them. What's second place? Permanent homes. What's third place? Vehicles. Now, why not churches or long span storms like Walmart or, or Lowe's or something like that? Why not outside or at school or permanent structures like big office buildings? Well, you got to think about this. The most common time of day for thunderstorms is 5 p.m. Where are people? They're driving home or they are at home or in their mobile home. It's the time of day versus where people are. Keep that in mind as we move forward. Next, where, which state has the most fatalities in terms of the rate? That's the number of fatalities per population. Mississippi ranks number one. Mississippi is followed by Arkansas and Alabama. So the top three, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Alabama. Number four, Illinois. High population, in Tornado Alley, lots of tornadoes, high fatality rate. Number five, Indiana. So there you go, Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, Illinois, Indiana. Those are your top five. Now, why are tornadoes so common in the southeast? Well, what I want you to see here is this animation that you're going to watch here in the upper right-hand corner. It's going to go through month by month showing you January, February, and so on and so forth when we have tornadoes. And what you can clearly see in this animation is that tornadoes happen year-round in the Gulf states. They happen year-round down there. And as a consequence, well, we just have a lot of tornado warnings, and we have a lot of people that are very vulnerable to tornadoes. And this is something I really want to make a strong point about. Not only do they have wintertime tornadoes, not only do they have nocturnal tornadoes, those are ones that occur overnight, but we're talking about a part of the world, a part of the country, that is very, very economically depressed. Mississippi, Alabama, parts of Louisiana, Arkansas. This is what I'm talking about. You see, this map here that we made shows you what we call the Continental Poverty Divide. Each one of the counties that you see here is color-coded according to its poverty level. And the warmer colors represent higher poverty rate, and the bluer colors represent lower poverty rates. Mississippi is one of the poorest states in the United States. 
It also has a lot of tornado activity. A lot of those tornadoes happen overnight, and it's very heavily forested, which means we can't see tornadoes off in the distance. And as a consequence, we have a lot of fatalities there. When you add all this up, remember, people in Mississippi that are poor often live in mobile homes. And what's tragic is, a lot of times people that live in mobile homes are immobile. And when these massive tornadoes rip through, they hit substandard construction where poor people live and the fatality count rises. That's why the highest fatality rate is down here in Mississippi, Alabama, parts of Louisiana, and Arkansas. Now, up in Illinois and Indiana, we're in a tornado alley, but we have high population centers, which means there's just more people to interact with tornadoes. That's why historically, over the last 100 years, we rank fourth and fifth. So keep that in mind, okay? Question for you before we move on. How many tornadoes hit the United States each year? We covered this in a previous lecture. Do you remember the number? Well, the answer is 1,400. That's the 10-year average on tornadoes in the United States, 1,400 tornadoes. Here's another question. What percentage of the world's tornadoes do you think are found in the United States? Look at it, 10%, 25%, 50%, 75%, or 90%. What do you think? Well, let's answer these two, uh, this question and kind of understand uh, why there are so many tornadoes in the United States. So here we go. This is a map showing you the locations of all tornadoes since 1950. It's pretty impressive to see this. Now, remember, there are tornadoes that happen out here in the Intermountain West, but there's not a lot of people to report them. Tornadoes uh, here across the West Coast are quite infrequent. The atmosphere is too stable. But east of the Rocky Mountains, basically no place east of the Rocky Mountains has really been left untouched by tornadoes. Now, you may be saying, well, wait a minute, why not right in through here? Well, when you look right in through this area, well, this is an area where we have a lot of mountains, so the Appalachian Mountains. And therefore, not a lot of people live there to report them, but they still do occur there. We have a similar feature right here in the Ozarks. See how very few are reported there? Or down here in the Everglades. They're kind of pointing these areas out. But tornadoes are quite frequent across the United States. By latitude, check this out. This is really kind of neat. When we think about this in terms of latitude, you can clearly see that there's a couple of regions that there's very high numbers of tornadoes. For example, right here in this section of the country, and right here again. Now, why in the middle, you know, why right here do we see so few reports? Well, again, the Ozark Mountains. Not a lot of people are there to report those tornadoes. That's why there's a little dip right in through here. Similarly, there's another dip right over here when we look at longitude because of the Appalachian Mountains, which run through this area. But when you want to kind of bullseye a location for having the most uh, reports of tornadoes, it's going to be right in through this corridor, right in through here. So impressive to see that. And just so you see... This little section right here that runs through a Champaign-Urbana, that's a spot, that's a hot spot in terms of latitude for having a lot of tornadoes. Let's, cost, let's take a look at Canada here. Uh, so when we're taking a look at Canada, just know that Canada, just like everything else with Canada, is all concentrated along the U.S. border. And about 5% of the world tornadoes, about 100 per year, happen in Canada. Each one of those dots kind of shows you from uh, 1792 to 2009, all confirmed tornadoes, at least all the ones that we have here uh, in the U.S. I'm sorry, in Canada. What about the what about Europe? On average, about 300 per year, with the UK uh, leading with about 30 per year. But you can see that tornadoes are quite frequent uh, in, in Europe as well. If we zoom in here, right around where the University of Illinois is located, which is in Champaign County, we can see the county reports from 1950 to 2013. So I just kind of left this. This is a little bit older data, but I left it in here because it makes a point. Why does Sangamon County, McLean County, and Champaign County have more reports than any of the other surrounding counties? Well, a couple of reasons. One, those are three big counties. Two, they have big population centers. We have Bloomington Normal here, whereas, which is where Illinois State is located, Illinois State University. We have Champaign-Urbana, where we have the uh, University of Illinois. And we have the state capital, Springfield. We're located right here, so high population centers. Well, what about Peoria? Well, Peoria's population spread out across Woodford, Peoria County, and Tazewell County. So therefore, if you add all these up, this would be another hot spot for tornadoes. But basically, when you look across the, 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 the middle part of Illinois here, we can see that uh, tornadoes have been quite frequent in Champaign County since 1950, well over 70 reports of tornadoes. So key statistic to think about there. Now, when I was a little boy, my grandmother took me on a ride in her Jeep, and we were driving through this little town in West Central Illinois called Chapin, Illinois. And she stopped the Jeep. I was about seven years old. And she pointed down this little area, this little uh, like ravine over in West Central Illinois. She says, Eric, do you see that? 
And I looked over past her. She's pointing out. And I said, yeah. I said, what is that? I said, where did all the trees go? She goes, a powerful tornado went right through there and ripped out all those trees about five years ago. I said, wow. And she said, we call this Tornado Alley. And for a long time, when I was a young kid, I thought Tornado Alley was this little tiny place in West Central Illinois near a little town called Chapin. Boy, was I wrong. But maybe that story my grandma told me is one of the reasons why I study tornadoes to this day. Well, what is Tornado Alley? Tornado Alley is a region where all four of those ingredients, a trigger mechanism, gulf moisture, unstable atmosphere, and wind shear all come together. I've highlighted it for you in the map that's just below the red letters there. That's Tornado Alley. Now, when we think about Tornado Alley, I want you to see this map that's over here in the upper right-hand corner. Low-pressure systems form just east of the Rocky Mountains all the time. I'm showing you one here that's in Nebraska. They have fronts. They have cold fronts and warm fronts and dry lines. And these fronts are all because the winds circulate counterclockwise around the low, blowing, well, cold and dry air into this direction, hot and dry air down here, and then warm, moist, unstable air there. Now, because of that, because these low pressure systems go racing across the country, it's in these regions where we get our most frequent severe weather. We have the instability, we have the Gulf moisture, we have the wind shear. See that big black arrow, Drew? Drew that is the wind speeds in the upper levels of the atmosphere. All of that comes together to make this region, Tornado Alley, the hot spot for tornado activity. But there's a second spot we call Dixie Alley. It's kind of another Tornado Alley. And that big severe weather outbreak we had, I told you about April 27th and 28, 2011, it happened in the southeast in what we call Dixie Alley. So both of these are technically Tornado Alleys. It's where we have the most frequent tornado activity. But when it comes to the all-time record, Dixie Alley has, well, April 2011. And that is the record holder for the most tornadoes in a single month at 747. Now, what's funny about this is people around the world are actually afraid of our tornado. Some people are. I had a former student who sent me an email. He was a student that was just here at the University of Illinois for one year, then went back to study in France. His name was Yanni. Yanni emailed me once in August. He said, Eric, back in June, this was in 2008, we had a tornado. It destroyed a couple of barns. It didn't hurt anybody, but it's been in the news for eight months. I'm sorry, for three months. I wrote back to Yanni. I said, Yanni, it was 2008. I said, Yanni, so far this year through August, we've had nearly 1,500 reports of tornadoes. Many barns and many lives have been destroyed because of it. You see, that just shows you how frequent severe weather is in the United States compared to other parts of the world. Again, April 2011, 747 confirmed tornadoes that eclipsed the May 2003 record, which was set in the century United States, of 503 tornadoes. That's a lot in one month. Now, the best place to go to monitor tornado frequency and to get some statistics on it is the Storm Prediction Center, spc.noaa.gov forward slash WCM. You can get graphs like this. This is the one I'm pulling off here at the beginning of July 2018. Now, July, I'm sorry, 2018 so far has been uh, really a low activity year in terms of tornado activity. Look, this black line shows you over the last decade the average accumulation of tornadoes as a function of time throughout the year. Normally, we get up to around 1,400. Right now, so far, we should normally be at 1,004. We've only had 571. And that is a very good thing. The map that's in the upper right, or the graph I should say, just shows you the last 10 years, each one of them, the accumulation of tornado reports. We are having right now our least active year in terms of tornado reports in the last decade. But the SPC also compiles these statistics with time, and they've outlined for you here both Tornado Alley and Dixie Alley. Just want to show you that in this map down at the bottom. All right. I told you a few moments ago that uh, we were, I asked you a few moments ago about what percentage of the world's tornadoes happen in the U.S. There's the statistic, 75%. But this map just shows you other regions around the world that have tornadoes. But remember, the vast majority, 75% happen in the United States. Again, one last time, just to show you that nasty severe weather outbreak that happened April 25th through 28th. Well, here we go. What made April 2011 the record setter was really the storm complex that went through when the Storm Prediction Center issued this high risk because of strong wind shear, abundant surface moisture, a powerful front coming through, and a rapidly stabilizing atmosphere. There were, in total, 355 confirmed tornadoes in a three-day time period. 
Tragically, 348 people lost their lives, and about a month later, another 162 lost their lives in Joplin, Missouri. Total damages, $11 billion. What was rare was that there were four EF5 ranked tornadoes, and each of the red dots here shows you just on the 27th each one of the tornado reports. 292. That smashed the record set on April 3rd and 4th, 1974, where we had 148 tornadoes in a 24-hour time period. Now, what I want you to see is this. You often think of Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas and Nebraska as having the most severe weather. But what I just showed you is the two biggest outbreaks of severe thunderstorms producing tornadoes in U.S. history happened in Dixie Alley. See it? Important thing to think about. And by the way, because of these two outbreaks, statistically, April 3rd and April 27th have the highest probability of any day throughout the year of having a deadly tornado. So if your birthday is on April 3rd or April 27th, be on the lookout for the potential for damaging deadly tornadoes. That's the because of these two days, the most common, uh, highest frequency, uh, I'm sorry, the, the day of the year that has the highest frequency of tornado events historically. All right, I want to give you one last statistic before we move on here, and that is this. The widest tornado ever that we ever recorded happened in El Reno, which is just near Oklahoma City back on May 31st, 2013. It was 2.6 miles wide. Now, if you're a student at the University of Illinois, let me give you some perspective here. This tornado, edge to edge, if it came over Champaign, well, one edge would be on Florida Avenue, the other edge, Interstate 74. That's right, had this tornado hit Champaign-Urbana, it would have wiped out nearly the entire city. Thankfully, it missed El Reno for the most part and went to the south, hitting a lot of agriculture area. But tragically, on this day, we lost one of the best storm researchers in history. His name was Tim Samaras. His truck was rolled by the incredibly powerful winds, which were measured by Doppler radar at 300 miles an hour. So impressive to say the least. We also want to tell you this, more Oklahoma. This particular city has been hit a number of times by tornadoes. Here's the May 20, 2013 before and after pictures from more Oklahoma when an EF5 tornado went through. I remember watching this day because in Oklahoma they chased tornadoes with helicopters and one of the helicopters was watching the tornado go right through this residential district hitting two schools. And I remember telling one of my former students, Zach, I said, Zach, I bet you this is going to beat the all-time record set in, the, in Illinois back in 1925 for the deadliest tornado. But you see, people that live in Tornado Alley, well, they know what to do. They're used to these things. Yes, they're destructive. But this tornado went through and did not set the record. In fact, very few fatalities were recorded because people know how to be safe when there's massive tornadoes like this in Tornado Alley. It's outside of Tornado Alley that we often find people getting caught off guard and therefore being injured or possibly killed. Now, to finish this up, I want to show you a rare event. Now, this map shows you the average number of tornadoes in November. Okay, so this is outside of typical thunderstorm season, which goes from March to September. Illinois, we average one. From 1991 to 2010, the average number of tornadoes in Illinois was one. But on November the 17th, 2013, the National Weather Service, through the Storm Prediction Center, issued a high risk for parts of Illinois and Indiana and Iowa and Michigan. They issued this high risk because all the conditions are coming together. And one of the Storm uh, uh, Prediction Center employees, a warning coordinating meteorologist, issued what's called a PDS watch. PDS stands for Particularly Dangerous Situation, and it is up to the discretion of the Storm Prediction Center employee to issue a watch like this. And they were watching because all of the ingredients were coming together. This is what happened. When it was all said and done, look at that map on the bottom. That shows you all of the separate reports, 81 tornadoes, 491 wind reports, and 42 reports of hail that were inside of that high risk. SPC nailed this, and they nailed it five days before the event happened. That's what the map in the top says. I will never forget this day. It's the day I opened my Twitter account. I opened it just so that I could put out 
advisories and warnings and let people know what was coming. Because it was a Sunday, it was the middle of the day, which is not the most common time of day for thunderstorms, and these storms were going to be severe. This is why. You see, when you step up to my level, when you're talking about understanding the stability of the atmosphere, we often look at our sounding data like this. Yeah, that's a lot of information. But what was going on? But well, we had a lot of CAPE. That's what I'm kind of highlighting right in through here. Look at all of this. Lots and lots and lots of CAPE. In total, there was 2,090 joules per kilogram of CAPE. What was our lifted index? Minus 7. Was there wind shear? You better believe it. 20 knots out of the south. Just above that, that was at the surface. Just above that, 50 knots out of the southwest. These storms were going to rotate. High supercell composite index, and they had the potential for making a lot of hail. Atmosphere destabilized, lots of wind shear. This map just shows you that we built into this part of the country a lot of CAPE. Some locations over 2,000 joules per kilogram of CAPE. The atmosphere was destabilizing. Was there a front? You better believe it. Right here, this line outlines where there's 60 degree plus dew point temperatures. So everywhere on this side, the dew point temperatures were over 60 degrees. And look at this. Winds are coming from this direction on this side of the front and this direction on the other. So we had southwest winds here, northwest winds there, and they collided right here along this boundary. And that was the focal point for the severe weather in the middle of the day. There's the front. See it? cold front draped right through there. Everything came together. Unstable atmosphere, plenty of wind shear, an abundant amount of surface moisture, and a trigger. That front that you see right here. When it went through, the atmosphere also had wind shear that changed both in speed and direction. And that gave us a high value of helicity. Now what is helicity? Well many of you have probably seen a strand of DNA drawn out for you, right? Now we call the, the way that the DNA behaves as a double helix. Well, when the atmosphere has winds near the surface out of the south and winds aloft out of the southwest, well, they crisscross like this. And that gets the air basically rolling in tubes like you see me drawing here. We can measure that and make a map of it. We call it helicity. And anytime these values get over 100, well, that means these storms can rotate rapidly. And we had that in Illinois and Indiana in the same location we had the front, in the same location we had uh, the abundant surface moisture, in the same location where the atmosphere destabilized. And this is what happened. Now this is a screen grab from this video, and I'll link this video for you to watch. It's from the Washington, Illinois tornado. Look at all of the debris. Remember what I told you? Debris is the number one killer. And as this tornado went over, well this is one of my former students, Grant's house. See the windows shattered? Don't be next to windows. See the top level removed? Get to the lowest levels. More pictures. One of my students sent me this. This tornado produced 190 mile an hour winds. Look at the damage path through Washington, Illinois, which is just outside of Peoria. One of my former students, Nick Barth, who flies, took this picture. Look at the damage. Incredible to see that. Alyssa Ift got me this picture showing you all of the suction vortices spinning on the inside of the tornado damage path. We'll talk more about that very soon. McKinsey Shell, one of my former students, also gave me this. Look at the destruction. Yeah, that's what 190 mile an hour winds will do. In addition to that, this storm produced baseball size hail. In fact, that's almost softball size. You're going to find out how fast stones like that fall from the sky in the next video lecture. Zoe, look at the trees in Zoe's picture, stripped of all their vegetation, stripped there down to basically the bark and the stump. Incredible, incredible images here. When I told you debris is the number one killer, this is what we're talking about. Now I want to show you this video. One of my students gave me this video that her friend took. And when we watch this video, we're going to watch it first. I'm going to describe it second. Here we go. <clears throat> Now, she said this was once four separate turns. What's she talking about? Well, in the next video lecture, we're going to be talking about how big, wide tornadoes like the Washington, Illinois tornado can actually be broken up into smaller tornadoes called suction vortices. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. 
She is driving on Interstate 39, and this is a picture of the supercell, okay? And while she's driving on Interstate 30, 39, uh, going south, the video is being taken from right here. So this little kind of outline I've given you, this is the stretch of roadway where we got the video. Now, she's looking in and seeing the T. She's looking into the hook echo, seeing the tornado. And I want you to watch what happens when she drives in to the hook echo. Check it out. Got a little Paul oh Simon God, in the background for you. Huge. <clears throat> and it's coming fast. Okay, this is as close as I ever want to get. Go, 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 go. Oh my God, it's huge. Now watch in the next few moments. Her car is about to drive right through this part of the hook echo. Okay, the tornado's just off the street over here. Gonna drive right through the hook echo. You'll see it when the rain hits the windshield. Oh my word. Look at all the crap that's in it. That's all the debris. We are going right past it. We need to get here past we go. it. We're just going underneath it actually. Oh my God. You can Here's the, the hook echo. Day. Now, why am I showing you this? Well, I want you to learn exactly how tornadoes like this form and what the storm does around them. So in that next video lecture, we're going to be studying this structure of the supercell thunderstorm on radar. And we're talking about hook echoes and forward flanks and rear flanks and updrafts and where tornadoes are located. And I want to give you a quick primer here by watching this particular video. So this was after the tornado went through uh, Washington. It was crossing Interstate 39. So as the last thing to discuss here, I want you to take a look at these two images. They're for Illinois, but honestly, they're representative for the entire United States. The map on the left, these are both from the National Weather Service, show us the time of day in local hours when tornadoes are most frequent. The map on the right shows us month, and I want you to remember these two things, okay? The peak time of day for the most thunderstorm activity is somewhere between 4 and 6 o'clock. Really, it's around 5 p.m. That's when the atmosphere is most unstable. That's when we have our fronts coming through, our trigger mechanisms, okay? And we also have wind shear, uh, and, and, and we've got the surface moisture. Tornadoes are very rare in the morning, and that's because the morning time is often very stable. We have temperature inversions in the morning, and therefore most tornadoes occur in the late afternoon, early evening. When it comes to what time of year, it's really gonna be April, May, and June, with May leading the way. During spring, we have these big low pressure systems that come through and trigger the development of thunderstorms that can produce tornadoes. So April, May, and June, five, six, seven o'clock, four, five, six, seven o'clock in the afternoon. That's the time of year that tornadoes are most frequent and the time of day that they're most frequent. So let's finish up this lecture just by recalling a few important things. Remember, safety. Put as much between you and the tornado as possible. Two, when we think about the distribution of tornadoes throughout the United States, remember where Tornado Alley is and where Dixie Alley is located. Three, don't forget the ingredients that come together. Four, remember mobile homes are the location where we have the most fatalities. And five, the peak time of day, late afternoon. Peak time of year, April through June. And with that, let's go ahead and wrap up this video.